Hello, this is Mother Michelle. I am from uh, Grace Church in Sheboygan and St. Paul's in Plymouth, Wisconsin. I am sitting with Sister Barbara Jean, who has written a book entitled Convents, Jails, and Other Tales. She also uh, gives seminars on developing your spiritual languages, and I would love to have a great conversation with you. Welcome, Sister Barbara Jean. Thank you for having me. Um, My book actually was written about 25 years ago when I was uh, in the Sisterhood of the Holy Nativity in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, approached me for spiritual direction and was rather distraught because she felt that she had been raised up in a in a faith tradition that was uh, fairly um, evangelical and um, of 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 a nature that that made her feel kind of less than um, perfect, um, and that you, she had to strive and work toward. Uh, God's love and was not up just really down and depressed because and when she had come into the Episcopal Church um, a friend of hers had given her a book and you know it's like I've just got the best book ever and you've just got to read it it just it just transformed my life and so she read it and it made her all the more depressed and feeling like maybe she wasn't even a Christian uh, let alone a bad one and I said, well, what in the world is it that you're reading? And she said, well, it's... And I said, well, okay, uh, number one, just stop reading that book. Um, you don't need to be reading that right now. Um, do you know anything about John of the Cross? No, I'd never heard of him before. Um, I said, well, you, you know, that book was really number three in his hit parade of, uh, of a, a trilogy that he wrote when he was in prison. You know, he was a 15th century Spanish uh, Carmelite brother and um, experience of um, of his spiritual life and his spiritual understanding uh, started out with the ascent of Mount Carmel I believe is the first one and um, and so it's really in my humble estimation it's really hard to start with volume three when you've never even uh, read a person's um, spiritual, Uh, understanding your treatise or whatever you want to call it and why is it that we spend so much time and actually I think waste a lot of time reading the wrong things and uh, especially when we don't know who the spiritual masters are in the in the um, particularly in the Christian tradition but I think it's true in other faith traditions as well so I began way back then of kind of doing a primer on who are these people who write these spiritual tomes that we read and some of them that we understand they um they bolster our own spiritual life they teach us things they move us to our next level and there are others that we read that we sort of go cross-eyed and we don't understand what they're saying and we get bogged down but because many of us have been raised with you know you, you eat everything on your plate and you don't get dessert until you finish that it's like I can't go to the next book until I finish this book even though this is hard slogging through and it can, um just a little uh, taste of who the person is what they're writing what period they're writing from um, and uh, and so it started out that way. So convents, jails, and other tales are about probably about eighty different um, spiritual masters of the Christian tradition through the centuries. Kind of, from, I think Saint Paul, you know, starts us off, um, and we move to um, the twentieth century um, because it was written in the late twentieth century last year. Um, it came out actually in uh, December of of 2015, so it's it's a year old now. And um, but what it's done for me, I've used it in many um, uh, the the manuscript of it. I've used in many teaching uh, situations. Um, and as I've done that over these years, it has um, expanded my thinking, my understanding. Uh, and every one of us has our own spiritual language, and so my uh, my ministry uh, isn't just to impart 
information about spirituality, but to help people, usually through spiritual direction, but also through um, retreats and seminars, that sorts of thing, uh, to uh, help a person discover that they have a language and that there are these um, writers of the past or present who can become a mentor um, through their writings. Uh, And we don't end up wasting time by reading the wrong thing that doesn't match our own um, uh, our own vocabulary, our own spiritual understanding of how God works in, in my life. Um, I love C.S. Lewis, for example. I love his, his, his children's uh, fantasy books. Um, but his, his uh, theological and spiritual writings um, I have a harder time with. And I'm thinking, well, why would, why? What, what, what's wrong with me? Um, there, and there's nothing wrong with me, and there's nothing wrong with C.S. Lewis. It's that we don't speak the same language. He tends to be a speculative or a, a heady sort of theologian. Um, and I, I tend to spend more time in my affections. Uh, in in the emotional side of my spirituality, so um, I discovered, and this uh, I, I I try to speak about in the first chapter of this book, of um, one aspect of spiritual language being apophatic or cataphatic, and most people their eyes cross when I even say those words. Yeah, what, tell what those is, words. <laughs> what does that mean? Apophatic is without imagery. And cataphatic is with imagery. It comes from Greek. Uh, Apo is without, kata is with or according to. Um, There are people like John of the Cross, for example, who is known as an apophatic uh, mystic. Um, He was not uh, helped by um, ideas of God that uh, that confined God to an image of of light or heat or uh, any of those things that that we tend to use as as an image of God, he he did, he wanted to do away with imagery because it it blocked him from an, a deeper understanding of God, and so his way um, was, uh, and in fact the diagram that he he kind of drew um, was in the ascent of Mount Carmel was nothing, 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 and when you finally get there up the mountain, it's even more nothing. You know, it's the the way of unknowing, and so we have we have the uh, the cloud of unknowing, which is an English uh, mystical writing, which in which the author does not talk about God again in in symbology of uh, the elements of of light and wind and heat and love and and brightness and all all of those those sorts of things, but rather we unknow. And uh, we get rid of those things that block us from the true knowledge of God. Well, I don't work that way. I'm an image person. I want heat and light and love. And, um, you know, I, I love to think of um, uh, in the Celtic tradition of the Holy Spirit, the image of, of the wild goose. Um, that, um, that speaks to my heart. And... It, that it, I can follow an image. I can't follow nothing. You know, I can't walk the way of nothing. I have to follow the way of something. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm a cataphatic person. And then there's that um, whether you're a heart person or a head person. I'm a heart person. That doesn't mean I don't think, and it doesn't mean that a thinking person doesn't feel. But it's where you tend to to experience the holy. Uh, do you experience it as a um, as a as a, a what, what was it that that Wesley talked about that that uh, burning or the the heat that he his heart was strangely warmed or whatever that I can understand because I have felt that um, then there are those speculative types who are, are more definitive and and it's uh, more in the head. Um, Meister Eckhart, uh, who is a, a a German theologian and mystic of I think the twelfth century. Um, my mic is is going down. Can I, can I raise my mic up a little bit without a mess here? Okay. So um, looking at, at that was kind of the first way I defined um, spiritual language was in kind of four quadrants. 
and where these mystics fit in. Are they cataphatic affective, so imagery with the heart, or cataphatic speculative imagery in the head, or in the uh, more cerebrally uh, thinking of these images? Or are they apophatic affective, apophatic speculative? And what I do in the book is I put them in those four categories. And uh, it's not just that I did it. You know, as I read, as I studied and researched these people, other folk who are a lot smarter than me put them or defined them in those areas. And I, um, so I put them in those quadrants. And that's, I lived with that for a long time, of just that aspect of spiritual language. But as I've gone on in these years, I'm realizing there are many, many other languages that help um, narrow uh, a focus down for me. What about a monastic language as opposed to um, uh, simply an, an institutional church's theological, systematic kind of language? Um, but then you have a monastic language. What monastic language are you speaking? Carmelite, Benedictine, Celtic, Franciscan? They all are. They express their understanding of God very differently. Um, so, so it just it, you, you just keep expanding uh, an understanding that that here's here's a, a way to understand God in a, um, a, a I want to say a more defined way, but a way that touches your heart more deeply. So to read, for me to read. Um, uh, a mystic like a uh, 12th century Spanish mystic, uh, Ramon Lull, of the Isle of Majorca, who wrote a book called The Book of the Lover and the Beloved. Um, that language touches my heart. Again, to read Meister Eckhart, one of his sermons or whatever, that, that he's, he is um, apophatic speculative. Um, and so I have to have somebody else define him for me and mine out the, the, the jewels in his writing. Um, and then I can go, oh, that's really cool. But for me to wade through all of that is cumbersome and hard. Um, and I want to help save people the time. Um, I want to save my time, too, because our time is precious. And so are you actually giving us permission to... Not read stuff that doesn't speak to us. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and if it doesn't speak, to put the book down. Put it down. You don't. You know, unless you're studying something for for a, um, uh, you know, if you're going to seminary and, and they your professor says you have to read this book and you have to slog through it, then you have to slog through it if you want a good grade. But if you are simply seeking to develop your spirituality, your understanding. Uh, of the way that God comes to you, speaks to you, and the the abiding presence that you want to know more about, um, you don't need to do that because nobody's there grading a paper, or you, you know, you're, and not asking you to regurgitate the the what you're you know you're getting out of this particular uh, writing. Or so, how do you make sure that you stay balanced and and not just read? what you like and not exactly well but once you have discovered what your spiritual language is um what speaks to you deeply um you can luxuriate there Mm -hmm. um like get you know you don't always take a bubble bath want a bubble bath is wonderful you know, the warm water and the soothing bubbles and maybe the aromatherapy that you get from that or whatever. You know, there's sometimes you simply have to just take a bath to get clean. Mm-hmm. You know, so there are times when you I luxuriate in, in um, um, a poem by George Herbert, for example. But then there are other times when I, I know that I need to learn something that's important for my spiritual development and luckily, since I already know my spiritual language, I am not so intimidated by. I can go to Meister Eckhart or to C.S. Lewis and say, what does this person have to say about this particular subject? Mm-hmm. Uh, without feeling like, okay, I have to read this cover to cover or um, 
I have to understand every word or anything like that. I can simply um, meet with another um, another pilgrim on the path that has a completely different experience, a completely different language um, than I do, and I can learn from that person. And, and I encourage those who come to me for spiritual direction, particularly, and others, that they do step out of their comfort zone. Um, and stretch, stretch their mind, stretch their heart. For for those who li- always live in their head, you know, yeah, you give them a, a poem that's that's really um, sort of schmaltzy, maybe, and say, meditate on this. You know, it's like oh, poetry! You're giving me poetry again. <laughs> um, there are some folk who just hate that. And I said, don't look at it as poetry. Look at it as um, another window, a ne- different type of window to experience the holy. Yeah. So yeah, you want to stretch beyond your comfort zone. Yeah, because I would want to, you know, just have a bubble bath. Yeah, that would be way easier. Yeah, very nice. But it also would put me in uh, a, a bubble if we go with yeah. an analogy and and not, exactly. And then you can get stuck there yeah. too. Yeah. Um, and, and this is true with most of our spiritual development is that we have to, uh, we have to be balanced. Mm-hmm. And so you don't just live in your own um, little, and it, usually our, our own little spiritual worlds are very small and cozy and tiny. And then, but we need to recognize that, that um, this whole spiritual universe is more vast than the physical um, so true. Yeah, but it would scare the bejeebers out of me to get in a in a rocket and, and I don't even like to fly, let alone go be <laughs> shot off into outer space. Well, what about spiritually speaking? Mm-hmm. You know, I want to I want to worship in my sweet little church with the sweet little hymns that I am used to all the time. Um, but what if I might experience the numinous in a completely different? Um, way of uh, in a completely different style of worship, mm-hmm. you know. For for a Christian, uh, particularly of the of the Episcopal uh, Anglican tradition, I, I it is so amazing to go to a Friday night Shabbat service at, at a synagogue. Um, you know, it, it it it's not your tradition. It's out of your usual comfort zone but oh my how it expands your own understanding of you know i I used to call it going to solemn height uh evening prayer uh when i would go to the friday night service at at the jewish temple was close Mm -hmm. um and i saw where our worship comes from Mm -hmm. it expanded my understanding i love it and and at the same token, I love the high Anglo Catholic smells and bells. Is sort of my that's my my uh, meat and potatoes of of my worship life. But every once in a while, it just is so nice to go to a holiness tradition uh, where there's lots lots of singing and swaying and amening um, <laughs> and and gospel right. uh, music kind of stuff. That's not where I live, but it feels like um, a rich dessert. Uh, to add to my meat and potatoes. And that's the way I, I think of um, reading those mystical traditions or religious traditions that are outside of my norm. Very nice. Not always a bubble bath. Sometimes you just jump in the shower and get clean. <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much. This is a wonderful introduction to this series. Uh, Next time we will um, delve into a little bit more specifics of developing spiritual languages. Thank you so much. You're welcome.